Hello, and welcome to the GRACE podcast series. My name is Denise Brock, and I am the Operations Director for the Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education, or GRACE. In this podcast series, we interview patients, advocates, and healthcare professionals to provide the most updated information for our community and to highlight important issues facing those dealing with a cancer diagnosis. We hope you find this information valuable. For questions or comments, please visit us at cancergrace.org. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack West, and I'm a medical oncologist, uh, an associate clinical professor with a focus on thoracic oncology, working at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. And I'm happy to be joined today by two of my colleagues who are also on the board of directors for GRACE, Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education. I serve as the founder and president, but I'd like to welcome two of my colleagues to introduce themselves, if you can. Maybe I can start with uh, you, Jared, if you can. Sure, I'm Jared Weiss. I'm also a thoracic oncologist at University of North Carolina. Ben? Hi, uh, Ben Levy. I'm a thoracic medical oncologist at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and primarily based out of Washington, DC. Great. Let's turn to uh, a fortunate, happy topic of the vaccines becoming available. Um, It's not a panacea. We haven't solved all of our problems. But for the last three, four months, we have had the gradual introduction of of now three and counting uh, vaccines. Um, What what are you... uh, seeing and doing in terms of uh, the uh, availability of the vaccine for patients with cancer who don't meet criteria based on age or or other comorbidities that that are often it's regional generally but so what what are you seeing and what are you saying to them about uh, is it safe is it appropriate to get the vaccine and Ben can I start with you here Yeah, and what a question, us living in D.C., where the rules are different in D.C. than they are in Virginia or Maryland, what a crazy, complicated navigation that's happened with the vaccine rollout. Um, You know, I'll answer your second question first, which is, you know, we're recommending that every patient get a vaccine when available. Uh, and, And, you know, there's been a lot of patients coming to us, well, I'm getting chemotherapy on a Monday, my vaccine's scheduled the following Monday, that doesn't seem like a great opportune time, and the Hopkins message has been that when available, we don't have the data on that, and when available, uh, please you know, go and get a vaccine. We are not making any comments on the type of vaccine, Moderna, Pfizer, others. We are saying that when it's available, get it, uh, no matter what treatment you're on. Um, the second issue, the, the, the question you asked about you know, the eligibility for patients is a, is a complicated one. You know, DC has been one of the best uh, areas, uh, it's not a state, but the best city uh, in terms of vaccine rollout and implementation and distribution, juxtaposed to Maryland, which ranks number 49 of 50 states on this distribution of vaccine. So you can imagine the chaos that has occurred when patients live in DC and are able to get the vaccine, but their next door neighbor who lives in Maryland, who's also a patient for us, can't get the vaccine because it's only available for DC residents. The rules apply based on residency. So it has been a complicated navigator. We're, we're trying to be beholden to the rules from DC. Uh, and currently it's opened up now to patients with a pre-existing condition who are under the age of 65. Uh, and we're doing a much better job than Maryland. So it's, it's in Virginia as well. So this has been very complicated for us in terms of messaging, not only to patients who are eligible for the vaccine, hey, you need to get the vaccine, but also the messaging to our patients who live in different states about why they're not eligible, but their buddy who lives in DC, who's also a patient here, who's uh, potentially a little bit younger, got the vaccine and they didn't. So uh, we've had a lot of work go into try to appropriate messaging for these patients and to be patient. Jared, what about, uh, you know, what are, what is uh, maybe UNC policy or what are you seeing in North Carolina uh, for, for 
patients with cancer who are older versus younger? So I mostly agree with everything Ben said, so I won't replicate it. Um, I will add that this might be the most common question that I'm getting in the room. And the lesson here to me is that it is a question. Patients and their families are asking, should I get vaccinated? It's not which vaccine is better, although I'm getting that question. Um, it's not how should I time this around my chemo? Um, it's is this safe? Is this safe and should I do it? Um, and they're getting a lot of misinformation, including from some from physicians that is anti-vaccination. So I'm seeing a very real um, uh, anti-vaccination movement and I'm seeing um, an even much larger mm, querying and, uh, and that it's an unknown, that it's, that it's considered something controversial uh, that you need to ask about. And so I'm really focusing on the, the, the more simple question of educating people on just how safe these vaccines are and just how dangerous COVID is. Um, I don't think, getting back to the comment about people not understanding relative quantitative risks, um, they don't, right? The, the economists have done the best literature on this and none of us understand risks well unless the data is really in front of us and visualized in a way that makes it real to us. People don't understand just how deadly this virus is and the message that how well these vaccines work, right? They're all pretty much perfect in preventing death or very serious illness. Well, That's business. not gotten out there yeah. well. This should not be a nuanced conversation. This should be a very simple one. So I think some key points that we should underscore are the the treatment is far, far better than the disease. And so one message that I think at least we should try to speak with one voice is, get the vaccine as soon as you can and don't fret about which vaccine because they're all very good. They're all pretty much perfect in preventing death or serious illness is what you really care about. You don't care. I mean, none of us like getting a cold, but that's not the big point here. It's not preventing a minor illness. It's preventing deadly and very, very serious illness. And they're all pretty much perfect against that. And that people don't need to worry too much about the timing. Take it when you can get it. And uh, and it is unfortunate and challenging that so much idiosyncrasy and variability based on where you live and, you know, the policies of the, of, of the moment. But uh, we can hope and I think expect that as there are more, you know, as we're exceeding 2 million vaccinations a day and more vaccine options becoming available, that we won't have to agonize as much about whether you're younger with cancer, but ever will get their chance and you just want to take that opportunity when you get it, that we should really be pushing against and not quibbling over the, the fine details when the big issue is just do not, don't fall for the, the government is tracking you kind of thing. This is not, this is a safe and highly effective vaccine. Well, we we can laugh. Unfortunately, lots of people, I think, are are probably our biggest challenge is that a very significant fraction of the country is disinclined to take the vaccine at all. And that is, I think, likely to be more based on misinformation or disinformation than a careful assessment of risks and benefits and deciding with a very thorough knowledge that they don't want it. Well, science is under attack lately, right? So it's no, it, that's nothing new. That's at least four years old, um, although it existed uh, pre-Trump. But um, yeah, I mean, it, th th this comes out of a fundamental uh, breakdown in evaluation of truth. Um, these ideas around tracking and abstract fears of vaccines. We're not in a rational, uh, in an entirely rational world where people are getting their uh, news from, you know, Yahoo News and um, online message boards and um, a lot of what they're being told is just not true, but it creates, that's part of the information stream that people are reading. Thank you again for joining us. This podcast was made possible by the generosity of sponsorship from our friends at Lilly and Exalexis. Please like and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Send us feedback, share your story, donate and visit us for more information at cancergrace.org. Thank you for listening.